Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this webinar. We've got uh, uh, my name is Bill Higginbotham, and we've got a couple minutes. So I'm going to just give people a little more time to sign in, and then we'll get started. Uh, if you have any questions, there's a, in your control panel. There's a uh, chat slash question box. You can just enter your questions, and we're going to wait till the end, and we'll answer all those questions at the end. Uh, if something urgent comes up, if you need to talk. Uh, and no one's responding to you in the chat box, just uh, raise your hand and uh, you've got a button to do that and we'll unmute you. I don't think you can unmute yourselves. So uh, just give me another minute and then we'll get started. And just so you know, we're having a torrential downpour right where I am. So if power goes out, the webinar is over. Well, hopefully, my electricity is pretty reliable. So hopefully, we'll be good. OK, so welcome to this webinar. We're going to talk about uh, full-time partial discharge monitoring. I'm with uh, EA Technology. Uh, my responsibility is all of North and South America for all the eight activities. And if you don't know EA, we've been uh, developing and selling partial discharge test equipment and monitoring equipment for the past uh, 40 years or so. So we've been doing this quite a while. We invented a lot of technologies and we've uh, uh, got some uh, things to show you. So what I'm gonna talk about is uh, types of PD. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on PD because I've covered that in previous webinars. And uh, by the way, all our old webinars are available on our YouTube channel and you can go there and, and watch those if you want. Uh, we're going to talk about online test methods, how we detect things online, and how we detect things non-invasively online. Uh, then we're going to talk about full-time monitoring and why we want to do it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our system. Uh, you know, this might apply to any full-time monitoring system, but obviously I've got access to the EA system and all those pictures, so I'm going to use those. Um, talk about how we lay out a system, how it's installed how you configure it. Now we're gonna spend a fair amount of time on data analysis, because that's something that people aren't necessarily aware of. Uh, and uh, then we'll get to your questions at the end. So we like to break down partial discharge into three types. Uh, internal discharge uh, is the slowest moving, hardest to detect type of discharge. So this is where you would have a void, an air bubble, a delamination, something occurring entirely within the insulation with no access to to air. Uh, and because of that, it doesn't create ultrasonic energy. It's not something you can hear with a, a typical measurement. Uh, the best way for detecting that is with a transient earth voltage probe. And I'll explain what that is a little bit later. And also UHF measurement. All forms of PD generate some level of radio interference. And internal discharge creates uh, UHF uh, radio waves, and we can detect those as well. Uh, surface discharge, this is the most common. This is what people think of when they when they see partial discharge. It's that tracking, uh, the white powder, the black marks, uh, all that uh, stuff that you see on the surface of the insulation. It occurs when the partial discharge current pulse travels along the surface of the uh, insulation. And it interacts with the air, it interacts with humidity. If you're in a... Uh, uh, a salt environment, if you're near the coast, uh, that can uh, greatly exacerbate the problem. Uh, so the uh, surface discharge will also create uh, UHF energy, uh, so radio waves can pick it up. Uh, ultrasonic measure, partial discharge on the surface creates a lot of very characteristic uh, ultrasonic energy. And so we can use that as a, a non-invasive detection method. It also creates light. It's a spark. It creates light mainly in the ultraviolet spectrum, so you can't necessarily see it. But if you had a, a UV light camera, also known as a corona camera, you could see it that way. But you need line of sight. So if it's occurring inside a cable or if it's occurring inside metal clad switchgear, uh, that's not a really great form of uh, detection. Now, corona discharge is a specific form of partial discharge, and that's where the current path. So Partial discharge is a current pulse. The current pulse, if it goes directly into air, so from an EHV station, you have uh, discharge directly to uh, the air from a sharp corner or a bolt sticking out or something like that, 
uh, you get corona, you get ozone generation, but you're not damaging the insulation. Well, you are damaging the insulation, but you're damaging air and air molecules get replaced by new air molecules and it doesn't lead to a buildup of damage and a eventual catastrophic failure. So we wanna make sure we can tell the difference between surface discharge and corona discharge. Uh, they do have slightly different characteristics, but they are very similar in that they both put out ultrasonic energy, they both put out radio waves. Corona tends to be a lower frequency than, than surface discharge. They also put out a lot of ultraviolet light, and you can find that, and that's what most people use corona cams for in EHV substations. But again, light's not going to help us in metal clad switchgear cables. So what kind of testing can we do for partial discharge? If you're not doing specific tests for partial discharge, you'll never find it. People tell me that, oh, I do a mega test or I do a high pot test. Those do not find partial discharge. They will find what they find, you know, damage in the insulation or uh, an average uh, degrading of the insulation or a withstand problem. But tan delta, mega, and high pot will not find partial discharge. So you need to do specific tests. Now, these pictures here are of an offline test. So an offline test, we take the equipment out of service shut it down, disconnect it from where it's connected, bring in some other source, a clean external source of high voltage, usually at a lower voltage, uh, lower frequency rather, uh, VLF, very low frequency testing is done at 0.1 hertz or 0.01 hertz, and that's to make the size of the equipment relatively small. Uh, you see in, on the one uh, lower right, that uh, was a test done to the cable. At, they attempted to do uh, 60 hertz testing at 360 kV, they couldn't even get the cable energized to more than about 250. So it wasn't a very effective test, even though they had three tractor trailers loads of equipment. These other pictures are typical VLF offline test equipment that you would see. There's a bit involved. You've got time, you've got a lot of expensive equipment, you've got the safety issues because you are creating a high voltage and you need to be safe there. So there's a lot involved beyond the real problem of an outage. You need to take this stuff out of service as long as the test takes. These tests can take uh, half a day per cable or half a day per switchgear section. So there's a lot involved doing tests. Great test, gives you great information, but it's very difficult to do. Better tests are online tests. So here we're talking real world. We've got 60 Hertz. We've got everything in service. We've got full load. We've got the environment uh, heated up the way it would be. Doors are closed and so forth, as opposed to something that might be uh, cooler. And we can do these tests non-invasively with specified equipment that is designed to use the power system as the voltage source and it's looking for things like ultrasonic energy or UHF radio or uh, uh, cable uh, discharge. So we're looking at those types of things. These are great tests because you can do them at any time. You can do them every day, you can do them every week, you can do them uh, whenever it's convenient to you, but they're not perfect because they're a snapshot in time. And we're looking at one point with one sensor at one time. And so that's not gonna give us a, a total picture. So they're better, but they're not the best. What is the best is 24 seven online monitoring. So if I'm looking at all my points, say I've got a lineup of switch gear, I've got 10 cabinets, I've got front and rear component, uh, uh, compartments, I've got cables, I've got breakers. If I'm monitoring all that simultaneously with hundreds of sensors and tracking it and trending it all together, and I'm doing it 24 seven, that's gonna give me the most information. And it's gonna give me the ability to discriminate what's noise and what's discharge. Remember, discharge is very low energy and we're in the presence of some pretty high energy equipment here, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of volts. And, uh, you know, we're looking for microvolts. So we need some sensitive equipment and looking over time or comparing similar equipment allows us to find the discharge. So that's uh, online monitoring in my view is the best uh, test system you have. And so what are we going to use to, uh, what, what modalities or, or what methodologies are we going to use to do our test? Well, first we're going to do ultrasonic or, or acoustic testing. So it's sound wave testing. We're looking for sound waves. And so we need an air path from the source to the sensor. If we're going to stay external to the equipment, we need louvers or vents or uh, parabolic dishes or some way to, to pick up that sound. Uh, if the equipment is very well sealed, then we're going to look at contact sensors that actually turn uh, a panel or a door into uh, a sensor and allow you to hear on the other side of the door, even though it may be well weather sealed. 
uh, we're going to use TEV testing. So that's transient earth voltage, uh, which is a voltage that appears on the outside of the switchgear as a result of discharge inside the switchgear. That will allow us to find internal discharge because internal discharge, as I said earlier, does not create any ultrasonic energy. RFCT testing. This is a, a radio frequency current transformer that clamps to the cable ground strap. So if we're dealing with shielded cables, we're clamping onto those straps. The current from the PD can be measured in that ground strap without having to connect to the live cables. And then there's UHF test, UH, UF, H, UHF testing, excuse me, that's designed to pick up radio waves. That's great, but if you're in metal clad switch gear or you're in shielded cable, the source of discharge is surrounded by a Faraday cage and you're not going to be able to pick anything up. So ultrasonic TV and RFCT testing are going to be the best for uh, monitoring a system live. RFCT testing is not necessarily non-invasive because we need, do need to install those, but once they're installed, then we can go and do these tests anytime we want. We can take a monitor, we can install it, we can remove it. We don't need to take an outage. So ultrasonic testing, this is where we're looking for surface discharge specifically. If you look at this picture on the right, we've got these three cables and the shield has been cut back too low compared to how close together those cables are. So this is purely a workmanship issue. You see the white powder, you see the black tracking. This is gonna put off lots of ultrasonic energy. And it's going to put up all ultrasonic energy in bursts that are synchronous with the power system. So we can use those two factors to detect it even in a high noise environment. Uh, it can be very sensitive. We're looking at equipment that is sensitive enough to pick up the ultrasonic energy put out by when your eye blinks. That's the kind of levels we're dealing with. When it's really bad, you can actually hear this with a naked ear. But we obviously want to detect it much earlier than that. So what we do is we capture the sound in the 40 kilohertz spectrum, well above the range of human hearing. And we're going to bring that down to a level that you, we can translate into something you can hear. And we're going to take measurements on it. We're compare it to the 60 hertz, variety of different things. And uh, that's going to give us a good detection for surface discharge. Transient earth voltage testing is something that EA discovered back in the late 70s. And what transient earth voltage is, is a voltage that appears on grounded metal enclosures due to discharge inside the enclosure, even if the discharge is inside the insulation. So partial discharge is a current pulse that results from a, a defect in the insulation. In say a switch gear, that discharge occurs inside the metal clad switch gear. It hits the inside surface of the switch gear. It's looking for a path to ground. It's gonna travel all around the surface of that switch gear. It won't penetrate through the metal. It will not go through steel, aluminum, even copper foil. It's too thick. It has to travel on the surface due to the frequencies involved. Eventually, it's going to find its way out of the switch gear, and it's going to look for a path to ground. It's eventually going to find the grounding of the switch gear, which at 60 hertz is a really good low impedance ground. But we're talking 60 megahertz, so we're talking a much higher impedance ground. And if we remember our, our college days, Ohm's law tells me that if I have a current across an impedance, I have a voltage. And so there's an actual voltage pulse. It's very small. It's in the microvolts or millivolts that appears on the surface of the switch gear. But we can pick that up with a, with a TEV probe or a TEF probe. And that's going to allow us to find PD even though we're outside the equipment. If you look at this picture on the right, I've got a cutaway of a molded CT that had internal discharge. And where that yellow arrow is pointing to, that channel had been eaten away uh, with, uh, with discharge. Now, unless you did a TEV test or some sort of PD test on this uh, piece of gear, you wouldn't find it. So you could have opened up this switch gear, cleaned it, run a mega test, run a high pot test, ran a 10 delta test on it, and it would have passed with flying colors. And then it could have blown up the next day. So that's why it's important to make sure you do all internal discharge testing. It's not fast moving. It's not uh, common, but it's also not detected with any other way, and it's not uh, visually, uh, it's not uh, something you can see when you go to take the gear apart. So you need to test for that. Cables, uh, very similar to internal discharge. If you have a defect in a splice or a termination or even an air bubble or delamination inside your insulation, anywhere down the length of the cables, you might have a two kilometer long cable. You need to test that cable. If you have discharge in that cable, you want to know about it before it blows up. 
and cables are, are probably the least reliable thing you've got going on in your uh, in your switch gear cable termination specifically um, fortunately what happens when you have discharge there's a certain amount of that current pulse that ends up on the cable shield and it's going to travel up and down that cable shield until it finds a path to ground and so if we can put something around the cable ground in the form of a radio frequency current transformer, if we can put that around there, we can count the electrons going through the center of that bore. And the number of electrons going through there is picocoulombs. So we can measure picocoulombs directly. And as this graph shows on the lower left, we can see the pulse. We can even see the pulse from reflected from the far end because we're dealing in, in, in short time frames and long cables, there's quite a bit of time between when the pulse, uh, initial pulse hits and when the reflected pulse hits. And sometimes that'll allow us to tell exactly how far down the cable the PD is occurring. So full-time monitoring, as I've said, is the, is the best method. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of periodic testing for certain classes of, of assets, but for uh, more critical assets, full-time monitoring is the only way to go. And only you can decide that. You're, you're the person employing it. What's critical? What's going to affect my process? What's going to shut down my refinery? What's going to give me the biggest fine from my regulator if I'm a utility? What's going to impact uh, customer reliability the most? And that's where you might want to apply full-time monitoring. You might want to do part-time monitoring or, or periodic surveying, as they call it, uh, on, on less critical assets. But when you do full-time monitoring, you've got multiple sensors, and they can all be looked at simultaneously down to the, the nanosecond to see where something starts. You can look at uh, sensors over time, you know, things evolve. And so you may be looking at everything's clean and what happens over time that you might not see a slow evolving fault with a periodic survey. We can also, if we're looking over time, we can compare that with temperature and humidity. Humidity is a huge factor in partial discharge. And if we look at the ultrasonic level versus the humidity, they correlate. And if, if you've got an ultrasonic level that's going up and down that matches the humidity going up and down, then you probably have partial discharge because there aren't a lot of other things that change their how much ultrasonic noise they put out based on the humidity level. Uh, changing load. So you have various loads. Loads uh, create heating. Heating creates expansion. You might have insulation that cracked and the crack gets bigger with higher load. So if you have a, a discharge level that goes up with load, that could give you an indication of what's going on. So all these things can be used to uh, the advantage of, of full-time monitoring. And precedence is a technique where we're going to look at things very closely synchronized. And at the speed of light, these pulses are going to take time. And so if we know how long it takes to get from one point to another, we can narrow down where that uh, discharge is occurring purely on the what they call the time of flight or the precedence uh, method. And that's what this slide is about. So when you have TEV, or when you have a discharge inside a cabinet and you're measuring it with TEV, that voltage that appears on the outside switch gear is proportional to the high frequency grounding impedance of that cabinet. And that's going to vary. That's not something controlled. That's not something we have any idea of. And so to some extent, the amplitude does not relate to where the discharge is occurring. Very often it does because you only see it in one or two cabinets. But in this picture here, I've shown five cabinets. I've got discharge in cabinet number four. The highest amplitude occurs in cabinet number two. Remember, this is something that we can't inspect for. So we've got to figure out what cabinet it's in best we can before we start opening doors. And what we can do is if we look and we synchronize all our TEV probes and we say, okay, what, which, where does it occur first? And we see that it occurs first in cabinet number four, then we know that that's where the discharge is, even though the amplitude might be a little low compared to other cabinets. And in order to do that, you've got to have all your sensors synchronized to within a few nanoseconds. You've got to be able to look at these uh, probes simultaneously, not multiplex. Multiplex means I look at this one for a while, then I switch to that one for a while, and I switch to that one for a while. That's old, primitive test equipment does that. The modern uh, gear tends to look at all the sensors simultaneously, so you can do things like this. The other thing you can do with precedence is, remember, we're trying to detect something that looks a lot like noise, and we're doing it in a very high noise environment. So we need to separate the noise we're looking for from the noise that may exist. You might have an electric motor, you might have an air conditioner, you might have a guy welding on uh, something outside. 
And so we want to be able to eliminate noise that isn't originating inside the switchgear. So if I've got these TEV sensors and, and I'm going to use an antenna, an external antenna, to also pick up the signal, and I can tell whether a uh, individual pulse hits the antenna first or hits the TEV sensor on the cubicle rear first, I can rule out anything that starts from outside the gear. So what I'll do is I will form a perimeter of antennas around the switchgear, and I will look at anything that hits the antenna and then the switchgear that's coming from outside. Anything that hits the switchgear and then the antenna is coming from inside the gear. So very simply, it's a very simple principle. It's very hard to do when you're designing the hardware, but it's a simple principle in that you know, these pulses do take time, not a lot of time, but they do take time to, to travel from one point to another. And this is something you really only get with monitoring. So what is full-time monitoring? This is a, the, the Wikipedia definition. We're looking at several data points simultaneously with multiple different sensors to detect, locate, and discriminate partial discharge. Discriminate's the big one. We wanna make sure that we're looking at partial discharge. We're not looking at corona. We're not looking at noise. We want to discriminate and know that we have partial discharge. And we will look at it over time to see what's happening trend-wise. Because TEV and ultrasonic are not absolute measurements, they're relative measurements. They're not, you know, a, a PD pulse of X picocoulombs doesn't equal uh, X dB of ultrasonic noise. I can't say that an absolute number is a bad thing unless it's really high. So I want to look at trends. Is it getting worse? And so looking over time allows that trending to work so much better. Our system's gonna have a number of things. One's a hub, that's the brains of the units, can provide the user interface, can provide all the, the power and the connections for everything. We've got a series of nodes and the nodes are what are actually doing the measurements. The sensors connect to the nodes and the nodes are providing all the, the uh, measurements to the hub that is then presented to the user. We're gonna talk about each of those components. So the hub, this is our hub. Other hubs look different. But basically, it provides a number of functions. One is it powers up and communicates with all the nodes. We don't have power going to all these nodes because we have a wiring nightmare. So what we're going to do is we're going to daisy chain all the nodes together. They're going to be powered up by the hub. The hub is going to communicate with all the nodes. It's going to provide uh, highly accurate clock signals that allow the nodes to synchronize within a nanosecond. And then it's going to do all the user interface stuff. So it's going to talk to these nodes. It's going to get the data back. It's going to store it. It's going to present it in a way that, that you and I can look at it and do our analysis. And so that's the function of the hub. So the nodes, these are the actual measurement circuits. So the sensors provide some sort of feed into these nodes. And then the nodes are actually taking the data, monitoring, capturing waveforms, capturing uh, audio clips, whatever we're looking for. It's going to do that detection, and then it's going to send it in a digital fashion to the hub. We can't send all this back analogly because we're talking teeny tiny signals and lots of nodes and lots of sensors. You just, again, have a wiring nightmare. So we want to capture it locally, digitize it, put it in the packet format, send it over to the hub. Uh, our nodes have built-in TEV sensors. They have built-in contact temperature sensors, and I'll show you that. You know, it, they measure the temperature of the outside of your switchgear. If your switchgear is getting warm and there's one cabinet that's warmer than the others, there's a problem right there. I don't know if it's PD, but it's something you want to know about. Uh, with all our stuff, it's all magnetic mount. It's all fully connectorized. You don't need an electrician to install all this. You can slap them on, connect up the sensors without doing any wiring, configure the system, and be up and running in a few hours without an outage. So the nodes are of no use without uh, sensors, but there's two types of nodes that we have. So one is designed to accommodate all the different compartments that might be in one cubicle switchgear. So if you think of normal switchgear where you've got a cable compartment in the back, you've got the breaker compartment in the front, you've got a metering section uh, that does not have high voltage in, so we can ignore that. We really have two main component, two main compartments. The, the cable and the breaker compartment. So each node is going to handle two TEV, two ultrasonic, and one cable CT. So what we've got is the ability to monitor TEV and ultrasonic front and rear, and we can also monitor the combined ground from the three phases of the cable. Not going to give us everything, but it's going to give us a lot in one little box. We can also plug in a relative humidity and ambient temp air temperature sensor. That's going to tell us uh, 
what's going on humidity wise. We don't need one of those in every node, but we need one or two of them per system. Uh, and then as I, I've shown the, the there is a temperature sensor, a contact temperature sensor mounted in the back of the node. So that's one of our one of our nodes. The other node is purely designed for cables. So this is collect a lot of information about the cables and any C, any PD that might be going on in those cables. So it supports three cable RCTs. It still has a primary TEV sensor and a temperature sensor, <clears throat> and you can also plug in relative humidity sensor if you want. So a combination of these nodes, and they can be mixed and matched however you want, form your system. The last thing we need, obviously, none of this is worth anything unless we have sensors. So we're going to have TEV sensors, which are our voltage, a capacitive uh, clamp, a capacitive coupled uh, voltage sensor. We've got ultrasonic, which is like a microphone, but it's actually tuned to 40 kilohertz and it's going to pick up only stuff in the 40 kilohertz band. The cable uh, CTs are these, these half split core uh, CTs shown at the bottom. And then we've got other sensors like antennas and the temperature and humidity sensor. Specifically, I'll talk about each one. So these are ultrasonic. So we're trying to pick up ultrasonic energy, which is airborne. Uh, we're trying to pick it up from inside the gear from the outside. And so we're going to use the, the sensor and point it at any louvers, bolt holes, vents, gaps in the door, gaps in panels. But usually there's a way in. Switch gear is not sealed all that tight. If it is, we've got the sensor shown in the middle, which is a contact sensor, and that magnetically mounts to the panel and turns the entire panel into an ultrasonic sensor. The downside of that is it's non-directional. So it's going to have uh, both sides of the panel, noise on occurring on either side of that panel will be picked up. So it's not as good as a directional uh, airborne sensor, but if your cabinet's totally sealed up, you'll need to use that. TV sensors, so here we're picking up voltage and we're doing it through a, a, a capacitive coupling. So through the plastic on the back of our node, through the paint, through the texture on the front of the switch gear, all we need to do is have two plates closely uh, parallel to each other and we'll pick up that voltage. We don't need a lot of capacitance because we've got a very high frequency pulse. The pulses are you know, in the megahertz region, so we can pick those up with a, a TEV sensor right through the paint and through the plastic. We've got one built into the node, and we've got a, an external one that can be plugged into the node for your second sensor. RCT, so this is a radio frequency current transformer. It clamps on the ground strap of the cable. Uh, the one in the upper right is an indoor one used anywhere where you don't have a weather issue. The, the bottom ones are made for outdoors, and there you need to disconnect the ground and stick them through the bore of these uh, sensors. But if you've got switch yard mounted equipment, or you've got riser pole mounted cables and you want to test it, you can mount one of these out here. And the one on the right actually has three RCTs built into it. So you can do all three phases with a single, single box. Now the antennas, they look like a 1970s car antenna. They're just a, a, a whip antenna. We also have outdoor ones that are uh, weatherproof. We have uh, mini whip ones, but basically any antenna that's a broadband uh, frequency responsive antenna will work. And they're going to mount in some sort of perimeter, either indoors or outdoors around the switch gear. Then for looking at the environment, because the environment is very important, we've got our temperature and humidity sensor, we've got our contact temperature sensor, and we're going to place them strategically in our system. So how do we go about designing a system? Well, everything starts from one line diagram. All right, we have a, uh, we're going to want to draw a picture that looks something like this, kind of a bird's eye view of the front and rear cubicles, because we said we got the breakers in the front and the cables in the rear. Where do we place the nodes? Where do we place the sensors? How do we run the cables? But this is a simple four cubicle box and the typical sensors you would see. Every compartment has TEV and ultrasonic, and we have our perimeter antennas, and we have one environmental sensor. Nice simple system. But in the real world, they're not always that simple. Here's a typical set of switch gear from uh, one of my customers. They've got a number of uh, feeders coming out. They've got, you know, it's a main time main setup. So they've got two main breakers, two main cables coming in, a tie breaker in the middle, and then a variety of things coming out. So we've taken the one line diagram, drawn this overlay, and we take that overlay and we apply it to our bird's eye view. So in the front, we've got 
17 front compartments has 17 breakers. In the back, I've got 16 cables. Typically, the, the tiebreaker position is empty in the back. So this is what I want to monitor. And this would be typical of a main incoming set of switchgear that if something goes wrong on this switchgear, it could take out my entire process, my entire refinery. So I want to make sure this gear, if nothing else, keeps running. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these icons that we use for the different pieces of the system and place them on uh, that same diagram to show me that I am covering all the compartments. So this is a, an image of a monitoring system designed to cover everything 100%. So along the back in the cable compartments, I've got 16 uh, cable nodes. Each cable node has three RCTs. I can put one on each ground. If I had multiple conductors per phase, I'd put one of these on the combined ground for both of those conductors, uh, two or three, whatever conductors you might have per phase in a, in a real high current environment. Uh, the cable node has a TEV sensor, so I'm monitoring TEV on the back of all these cabinets. On the front, I've got a row of switchgear nodes, and those switchgear nodes give me TEV for the front cabinets, and they also <coughs> support two ultrasonic sensors. So I've got one on the front, one on the back. I now have TEV and ultrasonic on every single high voltage compartment. <clears throat> I'm using uh, a couple of the TEV ports to connect uh, my peripheral antennas. So I've got four antennas here. I could have used six. I've got plenty of ports left over, but I decided four was enough for this picture. Uh, and I've got one environmental sensor. Say this is enclosed in a room. The room is pretty even humidity from one end to the other. I'm only going to do one sensor. If I want to put more in, I can. In fact, I've got a customer that's got, right now, they've got a number of uh, enclosures. They're putting the environmental sensor into the enclosures to make sure that the uh, humidity right adjacent to gear is uh, well controlled. And you can do that. So this system here, this is a pretty big system for us. It's got over 150 sensors all being monitored all the time. It's not multiplexed. It's not looking at one for two seconds, then moving to another. Because then you could go several minutes before you went back to that sensor. We're going to look at all these sensors all the time. So how do we install this? The hub's pretty straightforward. It does not have a touch screen or any buttons at all. It's designed to be used by talking through an internet connection or, or a PC connection. So you just need to mount it out of the way somewhere within 20 meters of the first node. Um, and you need to connect it to the internet. And I, I hope there's no IT people. And any IT people on this call, but I don't like dealing with IT departments. They don't want to see us bring in something that's effectively a computer and tell them, oh, we want to tie this to our network and we need access to it from the internet. IT departments have a heart attack when you tell them things like that. So it's the, the best installation method, at least painless, uh, or most painless, is to have a dedicated cellular modem and an antenna. They're a couple hundred dollars. Cell service is 30 bucks a month. And then you can get to it anywhere. You can look at it from home. There's a lot of us working from home now. And uh, you can also give access to someone else. So maybe you're doing the analysis and you've got a question. Say, hey, Bill, can you look at this sensor on this one node? I don't know what it means. If you're connected to the internet, you've got that ability. So now you need to place these nodes. Remember, there's a sensor built into these nodes. There's a TEV and the contact temperature sensor built into these nodes. So they need to be on the outside of a compartment with high voltage. And here's a variety of pictures. Some of them are temporary installations. Some are more permanent installations. But the node is outside the switch gear. That way you can look at the LEDs on it. There's power and, and error uh, and alarm LEDs on the unit. You can look at it. If something breaks on that uh, equipment, you can replace it without taking an outage. So you want to keep those outside the high voltage compartment at, at, all, at all costs. The sensors, so for ultrasonic, remember we're trying to get an air path. We, we want to hear this noise. And so it depends on how your switch gear is built. You know, the, the IEC type switch gear tends to be more open than the, the ANC type switch gear. But even with the ANC stuff, there's typically louvers or bolt holes or vents or uh, cracks around the door or gaps around the door. So you want to put that sensor outside if you can. Uh, if there's an issue, <clears throat> some customers have installed them internally. This picture in the lower left is uh, a sensor that was installed internally in the switch gear. Your TEV sensors are a lot simpler. They just go on the panel. They magnetically mount. 
and they uh, they don't really care where they are in the panel because that TV appears everywhere on the panel. So they're, they're pretty straightforward. RFCTs, the three words about RFCTs are safety, safety, safety. Uh, you're now in the high voltage compartment. So you need to be careful about cable routing and all that. And you guys know this. I'm not telling you something you don't know. Uh, we're going to clamp this on ground straps. We've got to make sure it's a good ground strap. Is that ground strap capable of handling the highest fault current I can have for the longest period of time that I can have that fault current. If not, don't put an RCT on. But if you've got a good solid ground that's going to be there, even if there's a fault, then you can deploy RCTs. You can install them safely, route your wires safely. And if you're not doing monitoring right away, let's say I'm putting in switch gear and hopefully next year's budget, I get some monitoring. And for now, I'm going to do uh, periodic surveying then you can bring those cables out to some connection point, like that, that test box shown in the upper right. Gives you a spot to come in with a handheld device and do a periodic survey or some panel mounted uh, connector somewhere. You can put that in. And then if you go to monitoring a year or two years down the road, you can just connect the monitor up to that box without having to take an outage. You know, once you get these things up and running, if you're on a five year turnaround cycle and you need to put monitoring in two years down the road, no one's going to let you open that cabinet. So putting in the RCTs now is, makes a world of sense. So now I've got all my sensors placed. I need to look, about, look at antennas. So the antennas, we want them outside the gear. We want them far enough away that they provide good coverage. Uh, you, know, you want to put them somewhere in the range of two to five meters away from the corners. If you've got a long row of switch gear, you might want to have a couple in the middle if need be. But basically, you want to form uh, a perimeter, imagine if you've got noise coming from any source, you want to make sure that noise hits the antenna before it hits the switch gear. And that'll dictate how many antennas and how far away you put them. Our antennas are magnetic mount. We've got indoor and outdoor models, and they're pretty straightforward to put in place. <clears throat> so here's a couple examples of systems installed. Uh, these are permanent installations where they've decided to run everything on the outside. and uh, if they need to get access to the switch gear, they shut down the monitoring system, take off the relevant parts, put them back on the same spot, turn it back on and they're up and running. So this, this works well. You don't have to put everything inside the switch gear and run it through channels and conduit and all that uh, to, to deploy monitoring. If you wanna do that, you can. We have a few customers that have uh, in the process of installing the switch gear where they was out of service for, for months at a time and just being installed. They took the time to run all the cables through trunking and through conduit, mount the sensors inside the cabinet, make sure everything was run safely and, and, and tied back. And, and that's great. It's the more expensive way to do it, but obviously looking at it, it's a lot cleaner. They still have the nodes on the outside of the gear so that it is uh, accessible if they ever need to do anything later. Once you've got all these sensors placed physically, you need to place them into the system and configure the system so that it knows where all the sensors are. And you want to do that so you can get a visual representation of what you're looking at. You may have two sensors side by side. You see these two nodes up here are uh, in alarm. They've got a yellow alarm. Well, that makes a lot more sense seeing them side by side than if they were in a list. So we graphically show you all this. And we also point out the cables. When we're doing this synchronization, remember we're trying to narrow down uh, the precedence, we're trying to see time of flight, how long it take to get from here to there. Well, the length of that cable is going to make a difference. So we're going to have to enter into our configuration the length of every cable that we use. Now, they're all pre-labeled, so it's not too hard. But, you know, with PD traveling down a cable where it's, you know, 10 inches per nanosecond, if I want to discriminate between two uh, Two cabinets, I need to know whether there's a two meter cable or a five meter cable there. So you need to enter all that in when you're doing your configuration. So now here's the big thing that everybody gets surprised about. Well, what about analyzing the data? I just want a red light when I have PD and I want a green light when I don't have PD. And, and that comes up, it came up today. I had a customer today ask me, I don't want to do any analysis. I just want a relay contact that I can put in my SCADA system. And I said, well, I, I can't help you. Uh, I'd love to but you're not gonna be happy because the state of the art in monitoring systems now is that we need a human to look at the data. We, we do this all over the world. We have hundreds of systems that we monitor for customers. We have hundreds of systems that customers monitor themselves. And 
if anybody tries to put it into a, 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 a directly into a SCADA system of that without any analysis, we know they're not going to be happy. We're going to give you lots of tools. The system is going to give you lots of information. It's going to have algorithms to help you analyze it. You know, you're not hung out to dry on your own, but state of the art for everyone is you need a human in the loop. If you don't put a human in the loop, you're not going to be happy. If you take anything away from this presentation, remember that. So we're going to use things like trending. We're going to listen to sounds. We're going to look at levels across the system. We're going to look at precedence. We're going to look at waveforms. We're going to do all these things. And I'm going to go through how what you have available to do it. But basically, if you look at this false alarm, if I had a uh, you know alarm trigger on that that pulse, I would you get something into my SCADA system, and then the SCADA boys would be saying, "You need to do something." Well, I don't. I need to know that that's a false alarm. I need to know when I've got real PD. So you need to be real careful with uh, with your analysis. So in order to do the analysis, I need data. What am I going to get out of the system? So some of the things we're going to get. Are, are trends and correlation. By trends and correlated trends, I tend to say is something changing over time. Correlation is something changing over multiple sensors. So if I have 10 sensors that are totally quiet and I have one sensor that's very loud, that's a correlation that there's something going on. Or I have correlation that humidity and temp and PD level, humidity and ultrasonic levels are changing together. And if they're changing at the same time, that's a correlation that's going to lead me to some sort of conclusion. A trend might be a, uh, a level that's increasing slowly over time. I'm going to look at waveforms. Just because I have a reading and I have a level doesn't mean that waveform is a TEV waveform or, or a cable PD waveform. So I want to look at the actual waveforms for certain types of things. Sound clips. You know, for the past 30 years, sound clips or 20 years, sound clips on ultrasonic converted down into the audio band have been a tool that has been used and it's still a good tool. There are algorithms and built-in automatic ways of finding PD, but listening to sound clip is still something we don't want to get rid of. The biggest tool in our tool bag now is going to be phase resolve plots. If I can look at uh, the data over one cycle and say, okay, what, what pulses are occurring and when are they occurring relative to a cycle? And like this picture shows here, I've got two groupings and they're half a cycle apart. Well, so are the voltage peaks of a sine wave. And so it's telling me something's happening. It's synchronous with the power system. So it's probably caused by the power system. And it's occurring twice a cycle. That tells me it's probably synchronous with the voltage peaks. And that's going to tell me a lot of information. It's going to rule out all those other external sources of noise. So these are the types of data you have in order to do your analysis. So trending, looking over time. This is from a real system that was in the UK, and they had a whole bunch of ultrasonic sensors. And you can see, and this is just over a time scale of a few months, one sensor went up, all the other ones went up, but just a lot lower. But clearly there is something going on in that cabinet. Something's changed in that cabinet. Now maybe the monitor doesn't tell me I've got PD and it's gonna fail next Tuesday at 11.42 a.m. But it tells me I've got a problem, and if I don't go look at it, it's my own fault. You know, this is a pretty obvious one. They're not always this obvious, unfortunate, but you know, when you see something like that, this is a logarithmic scale. This this purple line is 15 times higher than the lines down here. So that tells me something is seriously wrong. This is a live system. I actually captured this just this morning and stuck it into the PowerPoint. This is a system that has seven ultrasonic sensors in it. And our system only reads down to minus 6D, 6 dB. And so this black, the blue line at the bottom is the lowest we can read. All the sensors are down there right by that, except for one. That red one's up there, 20 dB. Well, 20 to 26, that's like a 50, 20 dB is a 10 times uh, increase in level. So we're looking at 20 times increase in level uh, from the other six sensors. What changes over time that affects just one cubicle? Well, it's gotta be something going on in that cubicle. And by the way, you see this ultrasonic level going up and down. That is the same as the humidity in that cubicle, going up and down with the, the nightly temperature swings. And so that tells me there's PD in that cabinet. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to do this analysis. Of course, I'm showing you the best examples I have. Here's another example from a customer that energized brand new gear. This was energized uh, in... Uh, uh, September in 2017, or I'm sorry, March of 2017, 
and I think there's some 14 different ultrasonic sensors on this system. And you can see this one trace along the top is just getting higher and higher, nice and slowly, it's ramping up. And you know, at the end of this, that's when the customer uh, decided to take it out of service and found the PD. The second line that's kind of following it and also going up was a, sen was a second ultrasonic sensor in the same cabinet. So it was one of these cabinets that had uh, vents on the top and the bottom and the top line is the top sensor and the bottom line is bottom sensor and the discharge was very close to the top of the cabinet. So this is pretty obvious, again, trending. It's, it's, a, it's really gonna help us. Here's a correlation thing where we're looking at the humidity level, which is the blue line and the ultrasonic level, which is the green line. And clearly when the humidity goes up, the ultrasonic level goes up. There aren't a lot of things out there in the substation they're going to change their ultrasonic level with humidity. But surface PD is one of them. So that gives us a real good indication something real is going on. Here's a picture of a, an RFCT, the, the actual peak of cooling. Now with an RFCT, because we've got this bore, we've got a cable going through the bore, we're able to measure, count the number of electrons going through that bore. We can give you a direct reading in pico coulombs. So here they went from 100 to 300 in a matter of days. Uh, this is 12 days, that day 12 is 12 days after energizing. It stayed under 100 for the first 10 days and then ramped up. Don't know what that is. Can't tell you when it's going to fail. Can't tell you what the cause is, but I can tell you that's not normal. And when you do that, you can either ignore it or, or you can take some sort of action. So phase result plots, I touched on those briefly. If you imagine a sine wave and you've got something that's synchronous with the sine wave and is occurring twice a cycle, I don't care where it lines up on this scale, the bottom says zero to 360 degrees, because remember, I'm looking at a compartment. I've got three different phase angles in there, 120 degrees apart. So I don't want to get hung up on, oh, it's here, it's shifted over, because it's not necessarily aligned. I'm looking at two groupings. If I got two groupings, I've got something going on that is synchronous with the power system, and it's half a cycle apart. That tells me that it is caused by the power system. And your power system shouldn't be creating ultrasonic energy necessarily. So here's some examples of some analysis that's been done. Uh, up at the top here is a trend. So things were going along just fine, and then suddenly the ultrasonic level jumped up rather dramatically, stayed up until they shut the system down uh, two weeks later. During that time, there were phase resolve plots showing two groupings half a cycle apart, you know, pretty high, 20 dB above the noise floor. When they took the thing apart, they could see that this uh, CT it cracked, and we can tell you that sucker cracked on August 4th. And uh, had they done not had monitoring in, it would have led to a catastrophic failure pretty quickly. So this, in this case, the phase resolve plot was all they needed. Here's another system. We've got a couple uh, 11 kV cables. They're too close together. The shields have obviously been reduced, removed back to where that line is, uh, just above the top of the, the numeral two, and they're too close. You know, everyone knows this. Uh, you, your high voltage uh, guys know this. And what that causes, it causes that white powder, causes that degradation of the insulation. It also causes a nice, pretty uh, phase resolve plot. Shows me two groupings of energy, half a cycle apart. That's pretty easy. So if I monitored that and suddenly saw an increase in level, then I don't know whether that increase in level is due to PD or something else. And then I take the, uh, uh, the phase resolve plot and take a look at it from that time period. I can see that it is most likely PD. So that's something you can find before you open the cabinet. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a uh, phase resolve pattern from a TEV plot. So this is each one of these uh, green dots is one pulse that was detected and it's plotted at a given phase angle and an amplitude on the vertical scale. The uh, the blue dots are somewhere between 5 and 23 pulses of identical magnitude and phase angle that have occurred over time. And the red is even higher, as high as 42 pulses with exactly the same phase angle, exactly the same amplitude. So what this does is generates a phase resolve plot that's also a bit of a heat map. And so what we can see is I have two groupings. They're half a cycle apart. They are synchronous with the 60 hertz. Uh, this is a voltage appearing on the outside of the switch gear that's pretty consistent. What would cause that? Well, we know from 
thousands of panels we've surveyed, that's caused by internal discharge. So we would pull that out and, and do some more testing on that. Here's another TEV phase resolved plot that's got a different characteristic. When you there is another form of partial discharge or, or discharge type signal that is caused by floating metal. If you have metal that is in the high voltage field and it's not grounded, it's going to act like a perfect TEV site. And it's going to have this strange characteristic where it has the same amplitude every time because it's distance to where the, the fault is, or distance to where ground is, or distance to where the high voltage is, stays the same. So it's going to have this same amplitude. But what it does is the discharge moves around in phase. So you get these flat lines, very characteristic. You could go into a cabinet that was doing this and probably pretty easily see what's floating. I've seen screws on the bottom of cabinets. I've seen tools left in cabinets. I've seen brackets break off and be laying on the floor of cabinets. You want to find that and get that out of the way so it doesn't interfere with the other signals. Might not lead to failure, but you want to get rid of it. Here's a phase resolve plot from uh, Cable PD. The difference with the Cable PD phase resolve plot, remember, I'm now taking a direct measurement. I'm measuring those electrons going through the bore of that CT. Those electrons can go either direction, so I can have a positive and negative polarity. I can't have a negative polarity ultrasonic burst. So those are all showed above the, the zero axis, but Cable PD is showing me above and below. Again, I can see pretty clearly that I've got a positive and negative, which I shouldn't have because I've got positive and negative parts to my half cycle. Here's a phase resolve plot where there's clearly nothing phase resolved about it. It's random data appearing unrelated to the 60 hertz. That's very easy to tell that's not PD. Sound clips. Sound clips are, are something that we've done for a long time where we take this 40 kilohertz signal, which is way above the range of human hearing, and we translate it down to the 2 kilohertz center frequency using uh, a technique called heterodyning. And that doesn't change the nature of the sound, but just brings it down to the range of hearing. And it sounds like bacon frying, sizzling, cracking, arcing, sparking. It sounds like you would expect it to spark like. Now, if it's doing it twice a cycle, we're going to have a lot of 120 uh, hertz component to it. If it's doing it only once a cycle, which would mean it's only doing on, it's only giving discharge on one polarity or the other, you can kind of hear that in there. You can also see it in the phase resolve plot. But what that does is uh, that indicates to us that it might be corona, because the physics of corona discharge into air tells us that one polarity is much more likely to do it before the other, or one polarity is going to be a lot higher than the other. If I hear just a high-pitched squeal tone that doesn't sound anything like uh, arcing and sparking and, buzz, uh, and, and bacon frying, then I know that I'm listening to noise. So listening to the sound clips and a monitor that can give you sound clips from 100 miles away is great. And you can also send those sound clips to somebody. You know, maybe your, your guy that's the expert is out in the field somewhere else. You can send that to his phone and say, hey, listen to this. Does that sound like PD to you? So sound clips are a great way to do analysis really quickly. And that only works for ultrasonic surface mount discharge, surface discharge. We're also going to want to look at our waveforms. You know, there are waveforms that look like noise. There's waveforms that look like TEV. We can generate waveforms for both TEV and, uh, and the RFCTs. And so we can look at that and say, this is noise, this is PD. So that's really what I want to talk about. What are we looking at benefit-wise? Well, we're going to put this on our most critical assets. We're going to put it on the on equipment that's controlling our most critical process or our, our biggest reliability customer that we have. Maybe I've got a semiconductor manufacturer in my territory where I've got you know quarter million dollar fines every time I lose power to them. That's going to pay for a lot of monitoring. Things like that. So you're not going to put it everywhere, but you're going to put it where it's important. And you want to prevent that catastrophic failure because it's infinitely easier to fix something before it blows up. You know, if you can get out there on your terms and change it when, when uh, you have time, as opposed to when it decides to blow up, because like babies, equipment failures occur in the middle of the night. Um, you know, allows you to make informed timing maintenance decisions. So maybe you do have restrictions. Maybe you have a turnaround coming around. Well, this will give you some idea whether you're gonna make it to that turnaround, but it's also gonna help you with the planning of what you do during that turnaround. I've got a shutdown. I know that I've got a problem in this cabinet. I'm going to spend time testing this cabinet. I'm going to spend time re-terminating the cables, perhaps. I've got a, a joiner ready on that day. I've got uh, termination kits available. And I don't necessarily need to spend as much time in the other cabinets that were quiet. So it allows you to plan. You know, planning outages 
and planning turnarounds is a science and more information is going to allow you to make better decisions and focus on what you're trying to do as opposed to being reactionary. And, you know, periodic surveys are great. We sell a lot of periodic survey equipment. They have their place for the high volume, lower uh, criticality assets. But, you know, they're, they're, the full-time monitoring can give you more insight. And offline testing, offline testing gives you absolutely fabulous data of a non-real world condition. Uh, it's great, very hard to do, very expensive to do, and gives you dubious data. There are some limitations. You know, we're not measuring absolute values. Uh, during the first seminar, I had someone tell me, well, what is the exact value of this problem? The values we're measuring are based on uh, listening to a sound or listening to a TEV level. They're not absolute. So they're going to tell us we're going to look for trends, we're going to look for changes, we're going to look at differences between one cabinet and another. The absolute values aren't that important. We do picocoulombs on cables, but that's it. We're going to watch for trending. Uh, where we have very well sealed cabinets, arc flash resistant cabinets, it can be difficult to get uh, an ultrasonic signal out of it. So you might need to use internal sensors there. Uh, oil fill transformers don't put out a lot of ultrasonic, even though they may have discharge. Um, and they are also do a lot of phase to phase discharge, which doesn't create a lot of uh, uh, TEV. And our biggest limitation is you can't go and throw RFCTs on live switch gear that has the ground straps inside the compartments. Uh, you know, it's great on the IEC stuff that they use in Europe. The ground straps are hanging out there in the air. In North America and most of South America, we tend to use ANSI gear, and it's hard to get those RCTs installed. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I'll turn it over now if anybody has any questions. Okay. Um, first question, could you please touch on the outdoor installation? Is it suitable? The uh, outdoor installation of the, the, this, you're going to have to put the sensors and, and possibly the nodes inside the switchgear or inside some compartment. We do have a number of outside installations, and usually there's some metering compartment of that that you can put the hub and you can put the nodes and then run the sensors inside the gear. It's not ideal, but it is something you can do. Could you also explain at what point would we need more than four antennas? Okay, sure. So if you have, uh, you know, if you think about it, you're trying to form this perimeter, and if you have 25 cabinets in a row and you have antennas just at the corners, it's possible that if you had a noise signal coming in in the center of that row from outside, it would hit the switchgear before it hit the antennas. So if you have a long row, you're going to want to put some more antennas. If you have more than 10 uh, cubicles, you probably want to think about another set in the middle. If you have more than 20, you might want to go as high as eight antennas. Uh, but it depends on, on the length and how many cubicles you have in a row. OK, if anyone has any other questions, please type them into the question box. OK, well, uh, I thank everyone for attending. I will be sending out a uh, link. We got another one, Bill. Yes, go ahead. How is data historized? Is there a limit to how much data can be stored? Uh, no. Uh, well, there's always a limit, but the you know storage is cheap. Uh, so the the hub will store lots of data. Uh, we deploy the system two ways. One is we the customer owns the equipment. The customer does the analysis. So long as you're doing analysis periodically and, and maybe you want to download some of that data, you're, you're not going to run out of hard disk space. Uh, another way is as a service. So you don't own the equipment. We provide the equipment free of charge, install it onto your gear, and we connect it up to the, the internet. And the system is going to constantly feed stuff up to our cloud server. So it's never going to run out of storage. Now put it in our cloud servers, our analysis team, and we have guys in Australia and the UK and the US that are going to look at this data and they're going to tell you when you have a problem. We're doing that today with one of our customers in Canada that we're monitoring and every every uh, few days we give them an update. It's got a dashboard uh, and that's a, that's a good solution to the, the data overflow, but it also means you don't have to put out the capital expenditure. You don't have to uh, become a PD expert or keep a, a PD expert on staff. All you're doing is you're paying for the service 
of knowing when you have a PD problem or not. Okay. Um, can you download the data remotely? Yes, absolutely. So once you have the, the system, you're connected to the internet, uh, you can download, you can look at it and store it on the, the, the hub forever, but you can also download it and open it up locally. Can the monitors be installed on substation assets like transformers, circuit breakers, or regulators? Uh, the sensors can be, again, the sensors are not weatherproof, so you'll need a situation where those sensors will be inside. Uh, like I said transformers aren't, aren't great for these technologies. Transformers are, you know, DGA is a wonderful thing. Dissolved gas analysis is way more sensitive than any electronic method of detecting PD. So I, I, I Big fan of, of telling people to do regular DGA and not try and monitor transformers for PD. Uh, but anything that you can get the sensors onto that is liable to output a TEV signal or an ultrasonic signal, uh, we can put, you know, we can put use the system on. Any requirements for ongoing maintenance of the hub and calibration? Yeah, we. Uh, recommend that the uh, nodes uh, nodes are the only thing that needs calibration because that's where the measurements actually done so we recommend the nodes are, are calibrated every two years and that's a system uh, uh, typically we'll go on site we have a portable calibration system and we'll come in for a day and we can calibrate 20 30 nodes in a day and uh, you know you, you're back up and running the next day you mentioned testing using non-conventional methods. How about using a, a coupling capacitor and measuring impedance for offline testing? Are you purely for monitoring solutions? We are purely unconventional, if you want to call it that. We don't uh, we don't do anything where we connect with a coupling capacitor or do any connections to the high voltage conductor. Uh, we prefer the safety of non-invasive tests. So while there are people that that sell coupling capacitors and systems based on on that, we actually taking a signal off the conductor, that's not something the EA does. And the nice thing is you don't need a sensor embedded in the equipment. You can go come up to any equipment and, and do your monitoring without taking it out of service. Uh, just wanted to clarify that it is not possible to do an offline solution with customer owned implementation. Uh, if, are you saying, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. If you're looking at offline, meaning offline from the internet, yes, you can absolutely have the system connected uh, just locally or into your local network or into a laptop and use that. That's fine. If you're talking offline as the power system being offline, no, we need 60 hertz AC power uh, running through all the gear that we're protecting because we're using that 60 hertz as part of our phase resolve plot. It will not work if you want to use, say, a VLF offline test set. Nathan, did that answer your question? OK. <clears throat> and any other questions? Uh, how about using for rotating machines? Rotating machines tend to use direct connected sensors like like the coupling capacitors and that and the, the reason is the nature of pd testing on rotating machines is very different than in non-rotating machines so what we're for rotating machines you're looking more they all have pd every motor has pd every generator has pd coming out of the factory <clears throat> what you want to look at is what is the nature of pd and so you know by looking at what polarity it's occurring and, and the shape and that you could tell whether it's slot discharge or this or that. I'm not I'm not a rotating machine guy, but because they're looking for uh, the nature of the PD, whereas on switchgear and cables and that sort of stuff, we're looking for the presence of PD. Is it there? Is it not? Very different equipment, and we're not involved in rotating machines at all. There are people that do that. Okay. okay. The last question. <clears throat> That was the last question. Okay, so what I will do uh, over the next day or so, you'll you'll see a, an email from me with uh, the presentation, answers and questions and answers. You'll also see 
uh, a link to the video, this video, which you can look at. It's on our, it'll be on our YouTube site. And there's a lot of other videos on YouTube sites. There's a lot of stuff on PD in general, the science, <clears throat> less on the equipment itself, but more on how PD occurs and how we me measure it and why we care. So I'll, I'll send that all off to you. And uh, like I said, I'll end a copy of the presentation. So if you have any other questions, feel free to email myself or Tim uh, anytime. We're here to try and teach you. So thanks for attending. I'm going to end the webinar now. Have a great day.